chapter 11. All right, then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, which, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And then they went up to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came. The time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. And that's how the world ends. All right, what do you make of that? Yeah. It's pretty weird, right? Okay, so the fun part about this chapter and chapter 12 and chapter 13 is this gives you the most in-depth explanation in the New Testament of what the work of Satan is like in the world. So... They're important for us to read and understand, which understanding is the harder part of this because there's a lot going on. Uh, but they show that while Satan does have you know, incredible power on earth, he is defeated already. He is a created creature, right? He's an angel. He was created. There is not some kind of epic, the world turns it into this. They try to turn it into some kind of epic battle between good and evil. Because most pagan religions do that too, uh, especially Eastern religions, uh, Japanese mythology. So they try to make it between good versus evil, God versus Satan, and this is the great cosmic battle. It's not. Okay? There is, you know, Christ totally defeated Satan on the cross. Satan is completely under Christ's rule. Whatever Satan does, God allows it. And that's a whole other conversation, but we've talked about that before. Okay, so this is not some great battle of good and evil. Good one already. Okay, so verses 1 and 2, chapter 11. Measuring the temple calls to mind of Ezekiel's measuring the temple in Ezekiel chapter 40, which we're not going to read that whole thing. But Ezekiel chapter 40. Do, do, do. A uh, vision of the man with the measuring rod in the 25th year of our exile, the beginning of the year, very specific date. On that same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me there. And in visions of God, he brought me into the land of Israel, put me on a mountain. Uh, and it gives us a picture of him, and he looks like the Ancient of Days we've seen before. And then tells him, okay, go around and measure the temple. 
That's what happens in Ezekiel. So it's, this is what this is what this image is pulling to mind uh, for the people who are hearing this. Okay, so the temple. What is the temple? The temple is the church, right? So that's the whole point of this is there is a church. Christ knows that there is a church. It's quantifiable. Uh, the church exists. It is identifiable in the world by Christ. Christ knows his church and he knows where it is. So it is not... So first of all, it's a re, uh, redefinition of what Ezekiel saw in his vision. A kind of a redefinition. Um, there is not a physical temple that is being measured. All right? So this is not you know like a new temple that shows up. Can you get that door? Sure. Yeah. I turned this it, down. Okay, and is that or, down too? What? That heats off too? Or the heat is where it needs to be? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, sir. All right, so there's not a physical church. This is the church invisible, the church that Christ knows. Like when we sit in church on Sunday, are all the people in the pew believers? We don't know. We think they are, but we don't know because we can't see that. Christ knows his church. So this being measured, this is Christ's church on earth, not a physical temple. Um, so the Christians are, as a body, the temple of God. Uh, then it says... Leave out the court, All right? So remember on the temple in Jerusalem, there's the court of the Gentiles because you have the, the main court the Jews could go into, but there was the temple of the Gentiles. They weren't Jews yet. They hadn't converted. They were allowed to come there and like see the sacrifices and join in the worship, but they actually could go inside the temple proper. They had to stay in the court of the Gentiles because they were right unclean. And it says here, don't measure the court or any of that because that's given over to the pagans. So, um, there's no middle ground. You have, you're either in the temple or you're out the temple. Uh, so you're either in the temple worshiping the one true God or you are a pagan. Either you believe or you don't believe. There's none of this agnostic, well, I think there might be a God. Okay. Or, well, you know, I'm, I'm spiritual but not religious, whatever that means. Uh, you are either a believer in the one true God, or you are not. And that is what the fitness measurement's going on. So trample the holy city for 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. Uh, it's 1,260 days. Um, and all of those numbers show up in Revelation at some point. So 42 months, three and a half years, 1,260 days. Uh, they all refer to the same thing, the same thing. They are all a symbol of the escalated persecution of the church. Or, as we see in this chapter, the holy city. Uh, for a limited time, before the final vindication, so the last day, judgment day. So this is that little season of Satan, when he's going to be unbound, and he's going to have unlimited, just about unlimited power. So right before the end, when things get really, really bad, that's the 42 months. Are they a literal 42 months? I don't know. Probably not. It's probably symbolic. Uh, maybe. Maybe it is. But there will be a limited time when Satan is loosed for his little season, and he'll be permitted to attack the church. He will be allowed to deceive the elect if he can. You know, if the elect allow themselves to be deceived, he will infiltrate, infiltrate the church with false teachings, like he doesn't do that already. But it will impede the proclamation of the true gospel. Uh, now, when we compare the little season to the thousand years, you know, the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, uh, which is a thing, the thousand year reign is symbolic from his ascension until he comes again. So that whole period of the thousand years, that is Christ is reigning in heaven right now over us. Uh, so when you compare that to how long this little season is going to be, uh, maybe it won't be that long, but who can say? None of this stuff is uh, that specific or that um, literal. Uh, three and a half is also half of seven for what that's worth, the number of perfection. Uh, so the holy city, which they're talking about, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, uh, the holy city is always the church. So the church is depicted as, in Revelation, depicted as a holy city or as a woman. 
um, as the bride. So we will see in chapter 12, yeah, <clears throat> oh, chapter 12 is the great red dragon and the woman clothed in the sun. So that's this on the cover of the right there. So great red dragon, woman clothed in the sun. Uh, she is not only the Virgin Mary in that chapter, we'll talk about this next week, but she is also the church, as Christ calls his bride, the church, All right? Uh, so the, the church is always shown as a woman or as a, a uh, city. In contrast to, um, in contrast to uh, uh, the world, right, the uh, pagan world, uh, which is always shown as, or the city of Satan, you could call it that, um, which is always depicted as a prostitute. So prostitutes in Revelation are not prostitutes. They are false teachers, false messiahs, false uh, servants of the devil. Basically anything that tries to turn the church away from Christ. So not actual, literal ladies of the evening. And actually a lot of time in the New Testament when they talk about fornication, prostitution, they're not talking about sex. They're talking about false teachers. Um, but quite often they are talking about fornication. So, yeah, be careful when you read it. Okay, so in verses 3 to 4, the two witnesses are symbolic uh, for the church's witness in this time that's going to take place. So this is one of those times this isn't happening right now. Like all this other stuff up to this point has been happening in real time with us. And it's been happening since Jesus left and until he comes again, all this stuff's going to happen. This is actually talking about right before the end when things get bad, uh, the little season. So these two witnesses uh, are symbolic for the church's witness, especially for pastors as the pastoral office. You know, they are clothed in sackcloth, which is a sackcloth and ashes. Remember what that's for? Why do you wear sackcloth and ashes? Right, they're uncomfortable. If you're wearing sackcloth, you're itchy all the time. If you put ashes on yourself, it's corrosive. Uh, it's a sign of uh, repentance, a sign of grief also, but, but particularly a sign of repentance and mourning. Uh, so if like, you can't believe these people aren't repenting of their evil ways, you put on the sackcloth and the ashes and you're mourning for them because they're so lost. Uh, that kind of idea. All right, so even during... This little season of Satan, uh, God is going to preserve his church. There's going to be something left. All right? There's at least going to be these two guys. Uh, there will at least be some faithful pastors left to proclaim his word. Um, that's not going to be easy because there are going to be, the whole world is going to be in opposition to the message. Uh, there will be a lot who claim to be parts of the church and try to contradict what she says. Um, even members within the flocks they're called to serve will rise up in opposition against the faithful pastors uh, for remaining steadfast because this will be a time when, as Paul wrote to Timothy, men will not tolerate sound doctrine but will surround themselves with people who will scratch their itching ears. You know, Second Timothy chapter 2. Uh, but these guys are going to wear the faithful ones, they're going to wear their sackcloth, and they're going to carry on. And God promises that they'll be there. That's what these two guys represent. Um, we're also be seeing two witnesses. Said so it resembles Moses and Elijah. Yeah, so it's, so it's like <clears throat> Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? And what's the significance of two witnesses? Then it's true. Hmm? Then it's true. Then it's right? true, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you need the word of two or three witnesses to prove something is true. So it's never just one person's word against their own. If you got two guys. That say that's the way it happened, and that's the way it happened. Okay, so it's going to say, so what God, What this is telling us is that God is going to preserve his word so that you know that that word is still true. Uh, he promises that to us. Okay, two olive trees. That's in verse, what is it? Do, 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 do. These are the two olive trees, verse 4. Okay, that's from Zechariah 4. A lot of Zechariah coming up today. Uh, Zechariah chapter 4, which talks about. 
We actually haven't read Zechariah 4 in a little while, so we should check it out. Zechariah is just chock full of messianic prophecy stuff. That's good. So chapter 4 is um, the angel who's, this is chapter, Zechariah chapter 4, then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold the lampstand all of gold with its bowl on top of it and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps that are on the top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. And he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, for who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. Then I said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left? And I answered the second time and said to him, What are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden pipes, which empty the golden oil from themselves? So he answered me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. Okay, remember what anointed one means? Christ, right? That's what Christ means. And Messiah, actually. Anointed one. Okay, so we have, again, this is depicting uh, the church's witness to the nations, uh, which is authentic because you have the two witnesses. And the background of that is the prophetic ministries of both Elijah and Moses, which is also why they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. So John is saying that the churches can continue in their prophetic ministry. It does that through the pastoral office by which Christ is carrying out his prophetic ministry to this day. Not that we're telling the future or that we're laying down new authoritative inspired scripture, but we are speaking his words back to you um, through the power of the Spirit and through our preaching we are uh, still being prophets in that way so that immediately after they tell you hey the church is going to undergo all this persecution right before the end God promises that he's going to preserve his word even so uh, through faithful witnesses and the gospel will continue to be proclaimed even while most of the people in the world reject it then verses 5 and 6, uh, fire from the mouth depicts the power of God's word as it's proclaimed, right? Because we see that all the time. Tongues of fire, at Pentecost, that kind of thing. So the enemies of the church are defeated by the truth of God's word. Not only that, but they're killed by the word because that's what the law does. That's what I was talking about in the sermon this morning. So God kills us so he can make us alive again. The law always accuses. The law always kills us. It always convicts us. Always. No, we're never going to say, I kept the law. No, you didn't. <laughs> no, you did not. Um, so if people do not repent, of course, they're going to suffer eternal death in hell. The fire destroying God's enemies is reminiscent of Elijah's ministry. There's a lot of Elijah Im imagery going on here. Uh, right down to when Elijah stopped the rain from falling. Right? He said, okay, there's going to be a drop. And it stopped raining for, what was that? Two years? Three years? Three. Three? Yeah. So, uh, and then the plague, of course, is reminiscent of Moses. So the prophetic ministry of the pastoral office will provide, continue to provide God's witness on earth in the midst of Satan's attacks, but God will protect his witness even as he protected the Old Testament prophets. And verses 7 to 14 go on with the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer and kill them. So again, we're talking about this little season of Satan when it's going to get really bad toward the end. It'll look like he's killed the church. 
It'll look like it's done. You'll search far and wide. You will not be able to find the pure gospel, the light of Christ, which shines forth from his church, which are the lampstands, right? Will look like they're snuffed out. Uh, there's only going to be a flicker here and there. You know it's there somewhere, but it's going to be hard to find. But the church will be brought back to life by God after the three and a half days. And then Satan will be destroyed forever. Uh, I even have a note to myself. Ooh, three and a half years it was the drought. Go ahead. What? I was thinking about the three and a half days. I have, I have a friend who's very Catholic, and something about you have to stay inside and have your soy candle and your holy water, and you can't look out the windows. For what? That's, I don't know. I wondered if that was what. What did they do in the first century when they didn't have soy candles? Brand oil out there. Hmm. He sent it to me in the email. I'm yeah. going to send it to you because she asked if she could bring me all this stuff. Remember I told you the friend who dropped me off a rosary and holy water? I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah, okay. Her. Oh. <coughs> okay, so that idea of Elijah shutting up the heavens so it didn't rain for three and a half years is probably the foundation for um, the use of this time period in both Daniel and Revelation. Uh, because it refers to a time of suffering and persecution, uh, which will also be never be as severe as this time that they're talking about here in Revelation. Those who dwell on the earth rejoice over the death of the church because they no longer have to hear the exclusive claims of Christianity because... People don't like that because we're not inclusive. I mean, we are. We want all people to be one of us. It's like, but you have to, you know, stop doing all this other stuff, or at least repent and try, right? I don't want to give up the world. You guys are mean. No, we're not. We're just honest. People don't like honesty. Yeah, so they're going to bask in their own self-made spirituality. Uh, which is going to happen. And we're going to see it more and more and more. It's like, is this, is this it? Is this the little season? And it's not that bad yet. But we're going to see that more and more and more people are going to bask in their own self-made um, spirituality. They have no time no time for God. They're going to turn completely to themselves. Um, Isn't that half of what the world's doing already? Yeah, it's going to get worse. Like, you ain't seen nothing yet. So we know the second coming is not going to be today or tomorrow or next week. Right. Or Probably next not. Month. But how do we know? I mean, because... You because won't know until it happens. happens. Yeah, you won't know until it happens. Right, but according to this... There'll be signs, but like, but yeah, but if we're going to, is, this a, is it like, well, this is pretty bad, well... I'll say all these things will come to pass, bad, no. and it says not even the angels in heaven know the time. Right, so... Well, then what we kind of do, I, I don't want to say we do know, but we, we don't know, but we know it's not going to be today, today or tomorrow, or next week, or probably next month. Probably not. But is that even fair to say? Because no. then we're kind of knowing. Yep. And I mean, and they don't contradict each other, but it is going to get bad, right? You're really, really bad before the end. But that's not yet, because there's still too many of us. Because like, when you read this, it tells us there aren't going to be many Christians left. They're going to be like scattered. There are going to be a few, but they're going to be few and far between. Um, so. And are they going to be going, oh, the end must be near because there's only like two of us left. And like, no, they're probably going to be like, I'm not sure how I'm going to live till tomorrow. They're trying to eat me or something. It's it's going to get really weird. So, I don't know. I don't think we've even begun. No. Especially in this country with our persecution. It's going to get so much worse. Yeah, I would have to say that. Okay, so... Again, the church, just like these two witnesses get killed, they'll be brought back to life. The church will be brought back to life right before the end. What were you going to say? I think you were going to say something. Okay. All right, so Sodom and Egypt, where the bodies of the two witnesses are put on display, uh, refers to the cities, countries who oppose God's will, right? Sodom brought down judgment on their self because they refused to recognize God's natural order. And Egypt refused to bow to the true God in Moses' day. Uh, and so the plagues got thrown down on them. So these are pagan cities, pagan countries. 
which represent all the unbelief in the world. So the world and churches, in scare quotes, uh, through the influence of Satan have become worldly, which so many already have, uh, will boast of the defeat of the true church, right? They'll take joy in it, like, ah, we get rid of them. Just as the world mocked and defamed the Lord when it crucified him, right? Like, ha ah, here, we took care of you. Um, so there will be consequences to faithful proclamation. There, the two witnesses are killed, but they're brought back to life. Um, the breath of life from God is what brought them back to life. So the breath of life is in Genesis 1, Ezekiel 37. God actually breathed the breath of life into Adam to bring him to life. Uh, which, when's that going to happen? When, when is the breath of life going to be breathed again into people to make them alive? When he just comes to judge us. Yeah, yeah, so on the last day. This is the resurrection of the dead. I, I have one comment about sure. what Amy was saying, because, like, when I first was taught revolution, it was by my mom, you know, like 30 years ago. I was taught, you know, like, we don't have to worry about the end because we know where we're going, but we're, we're going to know when it's happening because of science. That's what I always, always thought. Mm -hmm. But then, you think about it now, all these years later, as I study more, like, I don't agree with that because the science has been happening since the beginning. It's already been <laughs> happening for 2,000 years. Right. So we really don't know because it just keeps proving over and over again with the plagues and the famines, we just keep cycling and cycling. So yeah, when when do we actually know? We really don't at all. We know nothing. Yep. But we know it's not going to be tomorrow or next week. Probably not. Probably not. Okay, so all of the the, the neat thing is, is that resurrection of the dead happens to everybody. It's not just like, oh, well, the good people will get resurrected from the dead. No, 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 no. All the unbelievers and pagans get resurrected from the dead, too, and they're not going to be too happy. So they got to watch, right? So they're going to watch, because at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, believer and unbeliever alike. They're going to be like, oh. oh. And it's too late for them. Zoinks, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to watch in great fear, because they're going to know, it's like, oh, this is happening. Yeah, that's happening. They'll know they're about to receive their judgment, and that's, that's it. Sorry. Uh, that's going to be a great and terrible day. The great and terrible day of the Lord. It's called terrible doesn't mean what it means to us, necessarily. Ter terrible things and amazing things. Uh, terrible to the other. Not yeah, it's not going to be so good for the other people, but it's going to be great. One? What about the ones who think that this is it and when we die, that's it, there's nothing else? Boy, are they going to be surprised. They're just going to be like, <laughs> really? They're going to be like, what? Yeah. Yep. So believers are finally going to be vindicated, right? They're going to be shown to be victorious. It's going to be terrible for unbelievers, right? Because they are going to experience unbelievable fear and anguish when they realize, oh, hey, there's Jesus. He's real. He is the one. And then the cosmos itself will react to what's going to be happening. You're going to see, you know, it says the sky will roll up like a scroll. You know, the mountains will be, the islands and mountains will be moved from their places. It's going to be uh, pretty amazing. Uh, and you also have imagery of that in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, Zechariah 14, and Hebrews 12 talks about it. Uh, a tenth of the city and 7,000 people killed here in Revelation, by these cosmic disturbances, indicates that some unbelievers will experience physical death on the last day. Cheerful. So it's like, oh yeah, you're going to die so you can be brought back to life again right away uh, to see that you're going to be judged and experience spiritual death for eternity. Fun. So those unbelievers who are not physically killed on the last day were terrified and gave glory to God. The problem is that they're giving glory to God too late. You know, that will happen. The unbelievers will go, holy crap, God's real. This is real. This is happening. That's amazing. It's too late. Your fate has already been sealed. Uh, the second woe is past. The third woe is coming soon. Uh, the third woe comes very soon. It came at the end of the chapter. To catch that. So not only do we have this, this other chapter of the, this 
chapter here in the uh, inter, inter, what do you call it, inter, inter, forgetting words today, they have medicine for that, uh, inter, intermission, that's it. So this is like an intermission in the action of the seven trumpet angels, and then all of a sudden we hear, oh, the seven trumpet angel blows and then the world ends. And that was the third woe. Okay, so the last section, chapter 11, the seventh angel blows his trumpet, and then you get verses 15 through 19. This is the scene of worship in heaven uh, because God is faithful to his witnesses. He's protected his church and her mission throughout the entire New Testament era, even during the last days of immense persecution during this little season of Satan. So that's the result of Judgment Day. Christ's kingdom is established forever. His enemies are destroyed and will suffer eternal punishment. Uh, while the saints who witnessed admitted persecution, even unto death, celebrate their place in his kingdom. So the same celebration of worship goes on throughout the New Testament era, even while the church on earth is under immense persecution. Because we join in that celebration now in the divine service, in the liturgy of the Lord's Supper. When heaven comes to earth, we are participating in that unseen wedding feast of the Lamb, which has no end. We can't perceive it, except in so much as we can perceive it through the bread and the wine, you know, the body and blood of Christ. But then we will see it as it truly is in heaven. Uh, so then we will see what we see through a glass dimly now, we will see the culmination of that celebration. Uh, and that is the reward given to believers because they've confessed Christ in the sinful world, even though such confession brought them to this persecution. So how can this scene of worship in heaven that is a result of Judgment Day be considered the third woe? Because it, the third woe is yet to come. Third woe, seventh trumpet, this is the third woe. So how can the scene of worship in heaven be on Judgment Day? How can that be considered the third woe? Well, to us or not believers? Yes. All right. Well, we know it would so, be a woe to non believers. Yeah, because not everyone's going to experience it, right? So the great majority of people will not experience it. Uh, so the third woe, because it depicts what unbelievers will be missing, because they're going to be experiencing exactly the opposite. So uh, in verses, what is it, 12 and 13, right? You are getting, you are getting the scene of Judgment Day. Uh, and then 15 to 19, the result of Judgment Day. So the result, believers will experience eternal joy in Christ's kingdom. Unbelievers will experience eternal suffering in Satan's kingdom. The third woe is, hey, it's going to be too late when it happens. Now, would we have any sadness or woe because we know that others are not joining us? I don't think so. I don't think so because there is no sadness. There will be no sadness and no mourning anymore at that point. So I would say we would understand. It would be just like, this is, this is just you know, we'll finally understand what it means for something to be just. It's like this is, this was the consequence, and we're okay with it. We'll be okay with it. Um, us today, we're not okay with it. I mean, it's kind of well, yeah. There's some people I think deserve that. There's other people. It's like, oh man, I really wish this person in my family would go to church and stop being stupid, right? Um, before it's too late, which is what all this is cautioning for. Before it's too late, before that third woe drops, when it's too late, and everybody's going to go, oh hey. I'm going to praise God because guess what? He's real, but it's too late for me to believe. Um, that's, that's why it's a woe, because so many will not listen. So, so many will not listen. Um, Do you know the percentage of the, of the Christians in the world right now? By the, uh, just by the, <coughs> by the numbers, such as it is, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to say, Almost half. Third to half. I don't know what the latest numbers are. I mean, there's like two and a half billion Catholics plus all the other kinds of Christians there are. So mm -hmm. call that another. So call it about half, not quite. Hmm. Okay. But that might be, there's eight billion people now. 
I'm going to say a third. I'll call it a third. I don't think it's half anymore. Yep. Interregnum. That's the word I was trying to find. Why am I inter? Interregnum. And what is that? Interregnum is a term uh, that was used uh, from uh, Latin rex, meaning king. So it was the time between the king when the throne was empty. Like, so the king got killed, they haven't uh, anointed the next king yet. Uh, also talks about when the pope dies, and they have to have conclave and vote for a new pope. Meanwhile, the chair is empty. Um, the the uh, sedante vacante, vacante, sedante vacante, empty chair. Uh, but they call that inter interregnum bet between the kings. Uh, so they call this an interregnum because it's the time between, kind of like the time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. So it's the time between <clears throat> the king. Uh, but that was the word I was looking for. Yeah, so chapter 12 to 14 is going to be more about Satan's little season before we get to uh, the next sevenfold vision. So we're going to have uh, the dragon the war in heaven in chapter 12. We'll have the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth in 13. Uh, the 144,000 in 14. Uh, a vision of heaven in 15. And then we get to the bowls, the seven bowls in chapter 16. And that's the third sevenfold vision. Uh, Who's the second beast? One is the uh, is a tyrannical government and the other one is false teachers. False prophets. Yeah. yeah. So there's three beasts, and like one beast tells you to follow these other two beasts. There's yeah, so like there's a lot of beasts because you know three because he's pretending to be God, right? So yeah, you get a lot of that. But yeah, we'll get to that very shortly. So that was as far as I wanted to go today. Next week we will talk more about this little season, more of what we talked about today, and then we will do chapter 12. And that'll probably take all our time next week. Doing chapter 12. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in 11. Yeah, there is. I mean, there's a ton of Old Testament that you could read to get background on this, like I said. I mean, it, it never hurts. Go read Ezekiel. Go read Daniel. Especially the weird parts of Daniel, not like, you know, the writing on the wall and fire furnace and that stuff, Daniel and Lines then, we know those stories. The other stuff that you don't read that much when you're a kid, the weird apocalyptic stuff, that's good to read, the visions. Read Ezekiel, uh, there's some parts of Isaiah, but uh, some parts of Jeremiah, but yeah, Daniel and Ezekiel are the big ones. And uh, Zechariah too, those prophecies. You get a lot of the imagery from Revelation that's being drawn from that. You know, again, not that John isn't seeing these things, but he's seeing these things through the eyes, being given these visions, and he's seeing these things through what he knows of his people's history, people's history in the Old Testament. Uh, so that's the lens that he is resolving these visions through to make sense of them and what he's writing down. So yeah, next week, I think I say this every week, but next week it's going to get weird. It's going to get a little you weirder. Said that last week. Yeah, it's going to get weirder. It's going to keep getting weirder. In 19 here, it said that God's temple was, heaven was open, his temple was seen, the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's been. Yeah. Yeah, because Jesus is the only one, right? Okay. There's a great, if you, if you really want to see a good image of that, look at the hymn, uh, Stephen R. Starkey hymn, I don't remember what number it is, but it's called Water, Blood, and Spirit, Crying in our hymnal. And that's the, the uh, image he's drawing. He draws it between... Christ, the Ark in, in Noah's time, and uh, Christ as the Ark of Life. And he ties all three of those imagery, images together in one verse. It's like, okay, that, that's pretty neat. Uh, so yeah, because Christ is... The, the, there's even a neat tradition, because there's a lot of symbolism you can draw between, obviously, the Ark and Christ. We're going to talk about the tabernacle. Um, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday for our uh, Advent services. But because, um, and you'll even see that in some hymns you'll see about talking about the one enthroned on the cherubim. He's like, why is he sitting on angels? That's the two cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, so the mercy seat is right there. 
That's where the glory cloud came and dwelled. Uh, so that being a theophany of the second person of the Trinity, the pre incarnate Christ, so of course he is also the author and arc of life, carries us from death to life. I forgot what we're saying with that. Yeah, so there's a lot of symbolism with the ark and with Christ uh, for those reasons. And then there's also a tradition that said, you know, well, we don't know where the ark is. There's a tradition that says the ark is under Calvary. What does that mean? Well, because when Christ was crucified, the blood ran through the ground and fell on the mercy seat of the ark where it's buried under Calvary. It's like, well, how did it get there? But there's this tradition, a uh, story that rose up around that, that that's where it is. And it's like, that's interesting. bizarre, but okay. I actually think it's in that church in Ethiopia <laughs> that everybody thinks it's in. Because they only have any in there. Makes sense. You know, is it is it lost to time? I don't know. There's a lot. There's a lot of good documentaries about it. Nobody's uh, in there, huh? Not even like once a year with the rope tied around his waist, kind of thing. Yeah, nobody's allowed. Really? I mean, I think whoever has that church knows where it is, but they don't allow reporters. Like they to this day, they don't allow anybody in yeah, there. Yeah, because to see somebody it. would just try to steal it. Well, yeah, of course. 